This is the Quantum Biology Podcast, where we break down the practical health applications of this emerging science, starting with healthy light habits and going wherever the quantum superhighway takes us. In this episode, we have a wide ranging discussion with polymath scientist turned quantum practitioner, Sarah Pugh. Sarah has a Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry and Genetics, a Master's of Research in Bioinformatics, and a PhD in FRET protein folding, a field that uses a combination of quantum physics, biology, and light. After a disillusioning postdoctoral experience working with statins and heart cells, Sarah took a leave from hard science and studied Pilates, myofascial release, Bowen technique, hypnosis, and medical ketogenic nutrition. Sarah sees quantum biology as the field that ties all of her diverse learning together, and she shares her thoughts on everything from chronic illness to addiction to magic tricks to morphic fields in a fun, energetic, and easy-to-understand conversation. Enjoy. Hello, Sarah. It's wonderful to see you. I'm so excited for this episode. Um, Your breadth of knowledge is really incredible. So let's just dive right in. And why don't you share your background a little bit so people know where you're coming from? Okay. Hello, I'm Dr. Sarah Pugh. And I started off as a scientist and I did genetics and biochemistry as a degree. So that was very standard science, quite dogmatic, but at least it taught me how to Um, do science and study uh, scientific journals. Then after that, I did a PhD um, in um, protein folding. And that's to do with how a protein goes from being a straight line uh, to fold up to become an active molecular machine that's three dimensional. And the, the way this integrates with quantum biology was back then, 20 years ago, I used something called FRET, which is fluorescence resonance energy transfer. And that's where you would attach two different dyes to a protein. And when the dyes come close together, there's a, a quantum effect and they transfer energy and you get different amounts of light um, of, of different wavelengths coming out, depending on a hat, whether the protein's unfolded or folded. But I didn't really understand the concept of how light and biology really affected our health then. I just was viewing things as as molecules and chemistry and stuff like that. And after that, I did another um, science project, which was on statins and cholesterol and heart cells. And this is where it was quite interesting because the cell membrane is a sort of point of communication and it's sort of like the eyes of the, of the cell. And people who are interested in sort of people like Bruce Lipton, he talks a lot about cell membranes and how the nucleus is inside and it's like in a cave and it doesn't know what's going on uh, in the rest of the body. Uh, but by then I'd already realized there was something not quite sort of, as we would say, kosher about how the research was going with, with cholesterol and statins. And this was, was in um, 2009. And I decided to leave uh, science and do something completely different, which was to become a Pilates teacher, because I also had really bad back and shoulders from hunched over microscopes and things like that. So I left to become a Pilates teacher. And for anybody who does work in the movement and fascia field, obviously, you learn about all the wonders that movement can do about the fascia and um, not just the act of moving, but what it does to your brain. It sort of stimulates your frontal lobe and it's really good for mood. Uh, and a lot of the time with Pilates, I just think it's because you're not wearing any shoes. And it's the same with yoga, that there's a massive benefit you know, to just not putting your feet in a shoe. And then the next level up would obviously be going out and doing it outside grounded. Then the Pilates kind of um, evolved into functional neurology because I ended up going into the rehab side of Pilates because in the UK, um, even nowadays, if you go to the GP or even a surgeon, you've got a problem. They'll just say, oh, um, go to Pilates uh, and it's there's not a single paper s- s- saying that Pilates has got any kind of studies behind it for injuries, yet GPs or, or physicians or doctors will happily recommend it now. Um, so I then ended up in that field of, of Pilates and I did functional neurology and I did it um, with a company called Z Health, uh, which is American. And then I also went and did it with, with a the Carrick Institute, because I want, you know, no matter what, I always have to do more and know more. And functional neurology would relate more to the body 
electric, not the electric body in terms of us being energy, but it's like how are we wired together neuronally, like, first of all, the nerves, like the, the electric cables in the house. Uh, and then it's also very heavily focused on different parts of the brain, like the parietal lobe, which is all to do with sensory. And obviously senses are really important in quantum biology because we're going to talk about sound and vision later and light. Um, and then it's also very heavily into vision and the vestibular system. So the vestibular system would be our balance system. And then a vision is obviously people are aware of that. But then the amount of brain that's taken up for our vision is about 60 percent. But then the vestibular system or our hearing is the first thing that develops before any other senses when we're in the in the womb. And again, it's um, from a quantum perspective, if your brain doesn't know where it is in space, as in um, either you've got terrible geolocation, you know, you never ground, there's issues with magnetism, you're eating uh, food that's not uh, from your region, your brain obviously gets very stressed out about that. But then there's the sort of version where if you've got um, your posture is is not great and your head sort of over here all the time, it confuses your your brain into where it actually is. And if your eyes are giving you terrible information and your inner ear is not balanced, your poor brain has got to sort of deal with this, this bad information. Like when children get hold of your video camera and make a video and you have to watch it and you almost get seasick. So that's the sort of the nuts and bolts of um, function of, of um, functional neurology. And it was very practical, even though the theory is hugely complicated, that the actual practicality of it, you know, we use different lights and there's lots of drills and exercises for eyes and inner ears, a whole, a whole world of it. So some of that, you know, was very quantum and I didn't understand at the time, you know, I thought it was just nerves and I didn't realize that the, the quantum impact of things and, and then uh, at the same time, I ended up doing hypnosis because when you work with clients, uh, people, especially if you do movements or anything, really, all of a sudden somebody will tell you something really personal. And it can be in the middle of, you know, doing some exercise or when you're meant to be planning out a way of eating. And then I didn't know what to do. So I thought I'll do a therapy qualification. And then with hypnosis, because I like everything, no matter what, I always have to have more and everything has to be done to access. I did stage hypnosis and street hypnosis and even close up magic as well. Um, and that's again now becoming what's close up magic. So, uh, coins and cards and stuff. So, so, so okay. not, like magic. Not, ser not ceremonial magic um, or any or Christian magic where you'd sort of have candles and um, set your intentions out to the universe. It would be, you know, like David Blaine kind of stuff and, you know, um, magic tricks. I don't would say that I would say. But the the, the interesting thing from a quantum perspective about um, close up magic is that, first of all, it relies heavily on how inaccurate and terrible our visual system is because it fibs massively. Right. And also a lot of people get so enthralled in the magic show that they go out uh, of, after watching and think somebody put something in their drink uh, and they go out and the whole world looks more beautiful and different. Or, you know, so, so there's like a hypnotic element, to, uh, you know, watching a show and, and whether you know how the tricks are done or not, it doesn't matter because it's, it brings great joy to so many people. So, yeah, we kind of accidentally went on a tangent. But, yeah, the, the crux of that was with hypnosis on a, on a quantum level, f f even though I've done it for 10 years, I always get new insights into it and new concepts. And then because I'm really interested in all religions, I've added in different aspects that are common denominators in all um, mystical or main religions into the hypnosis and it's made it work better. And then um, I'm quite into sound now because hypnosis people obviously do it with their eyes closed. So they're relying on the sound of my voice. And I don't know, is it my words? Am I communicating with the structured water somehow? So that's um, where I'm at with the hypnosis. And I think it's one of those things that that's the kind of topic that a bit like quantum biology is that you can just it can just go off and get enormous whether I mean there's people like Dolores Cannon that spent a whole career looking at past lives and then um it's just again I think an area that's been 
not poo-pooed. We've always accepted that hypnosis has existed, but I don't think anybody knows how it works yet. And I think now with new frontiers in quantum biology opening up, like studies on the ether, which I've got quite interested in, and a lot of the work about how our thoughts can actually um, have substance. I think there's a lot more to hypnosis and also the work of Rupert Sheldrake um, about morphic resonance. And I did, I have um, touched base with him about it. And he said the hypnosis is something that definitely has a morphic resonance sort of quantum biology element to it because, you know, we're touching on um, the aspect of our, is our consciousness in our head or is it um, out of our heads and out in the ether? Because there isn't a paper yet that proves categorically that our consciousness is inside our heads. So, so again, it's one of these things for people who are, you know, in, it, there'll be other people who are in that field as well, sort of, um, who either work as, as hypnotherapists or uh, there's so many different angles that that can go down like NLP and that there are other types of that kind of therapy, which um, is very quantum as well. And back now, to my of understanding of, of hypnosis sort of from a therapeutic point of view would be that it f- facilitates getting in touch with that deeper consciousness or that subconsciousness. And there's a, a receptivity to, to suggestion or to finding information or clearing out blockages that we're unable to do when we're just in our normal day to day consciousness. Is that sort of a fair assessment or how would you explain for people who are not? Um, that, that's sort of a therapeutic version, but how would you explain how stage hypnosis works where people um, can see a pink elephant in a tutu or I become invisible? Um, it's like um, that's the, that's, the, the, there's much more to it than that. It's like uh, on some level, yes, you're accessing, you're, you're removing the critical factor or the logical brain uh, that's interfering with or, run, or running the show and you're getting into the emotional brain. I sometimes call it the monkey brain that, you know, the brain that has road rage or binge eating or whatever and having a conversation with it and understanding, you know, wh- why, why is this happening? And then uh, helping people to make powerful positive changes so it's about having a communication with 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 other aspects of our psyche because the way you'd communicate with the subconscious is not quite the same as i'd talk to um you because it, it comes into things which people who are interested in things like sacred geometry the power of three or, uh, is massive in hypnosis lots of lots of things are done in threes and for some reason that seems to really massively please the the, the subconscious um, mm-hmm. And it loves numbers as well. And it's also very visual. And I think it's to do with lots of people. We can't process our problems in words. Yet when you go into hypnosis, you can ask people to close their eyes and visualize their problems or whatever it is as a color, a sound, a picture, a movie. And then like when we dream at night, which is a sort of our own natural healing, we're able to unpack our problems visually in a movie rather than trying to explain in words why this is happening. Because because if we could rationalize our behavior, then we wouldn't do it. So I, I, again, it's I'm always open. So I never think that I know it all, no matter what, something will always happen. And then I'll think, okay, no, you don't understand. Or I'll listen to Dr. Clinton. Um, and then I was listening to the other day about the heart. And I talk, I talk to the people's hearts and guts and heads when I do hypnosis, because I think there's a brain in all three. And then there's maybe another brain out here uh, and it, and that's made things better. Like the heart to brain connection. I always um, activate that in a hypnosis session and like heart math is something that is massively important. And then the heart center is in pretty much any esoteric um, thing you want to study from chakras to the Kabbalah, the tree of life and things like that, that, um, that there's, it's like you say, it's a route into our deeper self because some people want to access that through psychedelics and that's fine. And other people want to access it through prayer or Kundalini yoga and, you know, do it that way, or you can do it in a dream. And I just think for the right person and the right therapist, it's it's a beautiful combination, but like anything, I don't think it's right for everybody, if that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. And it's interesting how different people respond to different modalities, um, which is why I think sometimes certain modalities get thrown out without good cause because someone say, oh, I tried that. It's rubbish. 
Mm -hmm. But in actuality, it just wasn't an energetic fit for that particular person. Oh, definitely. And also a lot of it's about whether somebody felt safe or not, or whether you built rapport, because the, the massive take home message from doing functional neurology is that we're wired for survival, not performance. And it's like the threat bucket and how our bodies are constantly looking for threats, even and it, it, if they can't find a threat, sometimes it'll invent one. And uh, we're just obsessed with them. And this idea of being safe and having a safe place and a safe I was telling you about when I want my dream of having a particular kind of course would be a non-threatening environment. So mm -hmm. I think, again, back to the hypnosis is that, that there's this important aspect of feeling comfortable, feeling safe. And this is where when I've looked at people's heart rate variabilities, there tends to be lots of problems there because we don't sort of do basic things like going out and, you know, like cuddling or stroking animals or being in nature and just feeling sort of part of part of uh the universe if that makes sense absolutely yeah and that's a point dr clinton makes a lot which i had you know very much looked at the quantum you know quantum lifestyle strategies of grounding and being outside in natural sunlight from a from a physically healing perspective but she makes the point that it also um tells our nervous system that we're safe mm -hmm. and gives gives us safety signals which you know I thought was really interesting. If you're at a stressful job, you can go outside for a few minutes, maybe even take off your shoes. You're compensating for those stressors um, on your nervous system just by being outside and connecting. Oh, absolutely. And there's other layers to that, which I think we'll get into with the sound. But I think also there's an amount of sort of non-native EMF protection and then the, the the full spectrum sound you can get from nature because back to the idea of um being being stressed and functional neurology and the vestibular system the um the vestibular nerve cranial nerve eight does the vestibular system and our hearing and we don't have ear lids so we can't do anything about noises coming in whereas we can walk away from something or we can shut our eyes and i think it's a neglected additional stressor that people go through phases of heavy metals or MTHFR genes or um, all sorts of things that um, rabbit holes that people go down for, for stress, obviously toxic people. And then um, noise pollution, I feel, is quite neglected or just the wrong noises or earbuds. Uh, obviously, the EMFs there are a problem, but I think just constantly having the wrong noise. Yeah. It, could I haven't actually done an experiment to measure people's blood sugar um, when I when they're exposed to noise, but I would imagine it would raise it because the, it goes straight into the midbrain or the mesencephalon, and that's like the centre of the brain, and then it fires off the sympathetic nervous system, and you can't do anything about it because there's no you can't block the the noise unless you go around with earplugs on all the time. And it's like the blue light studies. It, we we know that if you um, sit under blue light and then measure people's blood sugar and, and mine as well, it, it's different to whether you sit outside and have a picnic and eat, you eat exactly the same food. So, so I think also the picnic analogy is it's not just the blue light um, or the sunshine and the grass. It's because it's nature noise as well. Yeah, the sound of the wind in the trees, the birds, the... Yeah, the, the crunk, crinkling of the leaves or the grass under your feet. Absolutely. Those are all inputs into our into our systems. OK, so, Sarah, you have such a um, broad base of knowledge to draw from. I just want to do a quick recap. So you started out in the hard sciences, biochemistry, genetics, bioinformatics, protein folding. Then you moved um, completely out of that area after working in statins when it became there was maybe some ethical practices that weren't lining up with you in terms of your integrity, um, went into physical movement, um, in all, in many different modalities, and then moved into brain-based consciousness based with, with the hypnosis. And then yeah. And then at the same time, I did some myofascial release and Bowen technique. And for that, that would be there are a huge amount of other therapists who people that do things like EFT and maybe there are other touch that gentle touch therapies where it works. And I have no idea. And now since coming into quantum biology, I understand. But then I went back to science in some extent because then I'm trained in medical ketogenic diets. And then I did a specialist course in medical ketogenic diets for mental health. 
And um, okay, so yeah, I was going to say that, and then we landed. Yeah. We're landing in nutrition. So we've done hard science, movement, consciousness, mind, <laughs> nutrition. And so you are really an ideal person to explain how quantum biology underlies all of these things um, because you have deep experience in so many different areas. Okay, so medical uh, medical ketogenic diets. And then? And then... You, you'd think by then I would be able to solve all problems, including myself, <laughs> but uh, not. So I'd got a long way with everything, but there was still like something that I was still missing a lens because I think what I've learned now is I can put different lenses on because sometimes somebody is doing all the quantum biology right, but they're not moving and twisting. And, you know, that's the problem. So I think, oh, that's easy. I can look, put my thingy lens on there. And then with, with the quantum biology, I think it's then I... Um, with all the things I've talked about already, I'm, I'm not looking at the level of electrons and protons and uh, that aspect, even though I should know better because I did do quantum physics as my PhD. So I sort of forgot somehow um, <laughs> about all of this and kept looking at big things. And then, and then I was still being a bit mechanistic because I also um, have vast knowledge of different supplements and that's a good and a bad thing. And that's, again, a mechanistic biochemistry that I keep thinking, well, this is the mechanism and where this where where a biological object, whereas really where like um, nothing or no thing, because if you break all the atom, an atom right down, it's like ninety nine point nine 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 is just nothing. And then there's a little nucleus of like um, an electromagnetic field. And this is back into this thing of how we're just vibration and energy and then all of the my old scientific ways of thinking about things, which do work to some extent, all fall apart. And then it would be now about putting, OK, a quantum lens on thinking, well, what's important? And obviously light being um, the what people may it's probably the primary driver of metabolism. I used to say it was, but then I don't like making general statements anymore. So then I got into quantum biology and, re and realized I was missing um, the circadian rhythm part, uh, which, uh, you know, it's all back to sometimes things are so simple that, you know, just seeing the sunrise and seeing the sunset. And I knew about blue blocking glasses and, and screens that that was ticked, but I didn't understand the point of I didn't I didn't I didn't understand about hormones being made. Um, when the UVA rises, yet I should have known better because I spent a whole PhD shining fluorescent UV light at tryptophans and tyrosines. And that's what um, our neurotransmitters and thyroid hormone are made out of. So, so, so I think it's something that it's really easy to have things, um, uh, you know, you can people focus, I think, a lot, say, in nutrition about have I got enough B vitamins, have I got enough this, that and the other to make whatever neurotransmitter or, or hormone, but they forget there's a timing, you know, you want to have things made at a certain time, not, you know, you can have all of the precursors in the world to make a neurotransmitter, but there is, if there's not the trigger, like the sunlight, the serotonin isn't going to get made. And I think that would be me looking at biochemistry as a, in a more quantum uh, way, sort of keeping things simple for the moment. So that was the, the beginning of my sort of revelation into quantum biology. And then I think it's also heavily into the mitochondria and how much red light is hugely important. And of course, structured water, which I'm sure you've had people talking about um, structured water and its vital importance. And of course, I knew that mitochondria made water 20 years ago, but I think nobody really realized they just thought it was a waste product like carbon dioxide and they didn't realize it's like the, the matrix of the body. And then to bring this back to functional neurology, that when I was taught, we were told the vestibular system is the fastest system in the body, whereas nowadays there's something faster than that again, which nobody's sure what it is for certain, although it, there's sort of speak that it's the, the structured water. Uh, and I do think that there's just not, you know, the, the, exactly the paper that I'd like to see, you know, that the study isn't out there yet, but maybe you have ideas on that. Yeah, I think it's all coming. I mean, the, the papers are getting fast and furious at this point. It's almost hard to keep up with. Um, and yeah, it's, you know, 
the science is irrefutable. It's just a matter of getting to the details of it and doing the experiments to get it on paper mm -hmm. um, and see exactly what what does what. But it's going to be super interesting. So let's dive down into a few into a few key areas that you um, just w went over. So you have this very broad scientific background and in including um, a lot of different parts of human um, physiology, consciousness, cognitive, and even religious, um, even the religious areas that we like to live in as people. Um, so you come to quantum biology and you see its application across all of these fields and you're able to say, oh, okay, now I understand why that leg was doing what it was doing on the proteins. And now I can extrapolate from that what the sunlight is doing to our bodies. So from a quantum biologic perspective, what, how does light affect just on, we'll just start with the physical. How does light affect our physical bodies? Why is it so important to pay attention to that? Well, I'd say the ultimate one is it's like the timekeeper. The blue light from the sun is our timekeeper. And a brain that can't tell the time is like a brain that doesn't know where it is. It's going to be confused and stressed out. But also um, the timekeeping um, gets knocked down into the, the uh, um, chaotic gene expression. And it comes into, again, a big topic of chaos that if, you're, if your body is out of sync, you're going to have a lot of chaos. And chaos is a biophysical or quantum way of describing inflammation. And, and for people who are brand new to this and think and, and maybe think inflammation is like a bee sting, I, I've gone more now to think actually inflammation is chaos. And the more order there is in the body, the, the better. So also you get from the sunlight, you get structured water, you know, the, from the red light, you're more likely to expand your exclusion zone. And that's um, ordered structured water. It's in, you know, it's like the opposite of chaotic water. Uh, and then obviously it's again the trigger for um, the sunrise would be the trigger to switch from the 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 nighttime hormones to the daytime hormones to signify a new day. And then for the, for the sunset, um, we have uh, the, the reverse. So it would be the, the trigger to convert the serotonin you made earlier from the sun, from the UVA um, into melatonin so that it's time to go to sleep. So that was a very sort of brief um, description of, of the sunlight. I left out the vitamin D because we don't have UVB all the time. So obviously vitamin D is massively important, but I, I, I always think, I wonder what the significance of not having it in the Northern latitudes is. Is it something that we are fixated on the vitamin D or is it something that certain people don't need all the time? But fundamentally uh, the, the, the sun or photosynthesis drives um, the food chain as well. And that's when I mentioned before about chaos is that um, ideally you, we, I have my own sunlight environment here and so do the plants around me. And it just reassures my body uh, you're in the right place and, it, and you know, you know where you are. If I'm eating plants, which the sun shone on um, and we're all in the same geolocation. So that would be another importance of the, of sunlight and health is it's sort of a way to I would say in some ways it's not just a trigger or, or, or something that fires our metabolism. I would also say it's an order maker in the body. Okay. So this, I love this way of looking at it. So light brings order to the body. Yeah. It creates order out of chaos. Another way to think about chaos is as inflammation. Yeah. And then inflammation is sort of the, the basis of almost all chronic illnesses. Yeah. Correct. So we could say whether someone's coming in with Hashimoto's or chronic fatigue or Lyme or what are, whatever, what's going on, fibromyalgia, all of the long COVID, all of these things, inflammation in the body is a precursor to that. So bringing, which, and then, then if inflammation is chaos and light brings order. Yeah. Yes, yes, well, yes, exactly. But also it's to do with um, the mitochondria, the machine needs to run smoothly. And for whatever reason, um, the red light can always get through the clouds. So every single mitochondria on the planet can get red light whenever it needs to. So there's some ma <clears throat> massively important signal there as well. So yes, it creates order in the body and limits chaos. But also I think it's um, 
you know, it provides or haven't gone into uh, providing electrons, which is like money to the body. But I just went for the sort of chaos um, idea, first of all. So fundamentally for the sun, it's something that it's like a life giver. And uh, however, whether you want to look at it, however you want to look at it quantumly. Right. Okay, so we, we'll go through. So the the light comes and brings order to chaos. So that's sort of benefit, huge benefit number one, especially if chaos is inflammation. Inflammation is the precursor or cause of or underlying issue with most chronic illness. Then on top of that, we're gathering electrons when we're outside. So we've we've got the light bringing order to chaos and we've got the light giving us electrons, which is another way of saying that it's, giving us energy mm -hmm. yeah yeah exactly because i think it's about only um i think it's we get 60 percent of our electrons from non-food sources and this is a massively difficult concept for people who are very focused on food to grasp so um yeah the, you know we could gather in um, the electrons uh from our environment and from the sun and then like i said the electrons are like money because in the mitochondria we've got the electron transport chain not the calorie transport chain or the fat transport chain and then the mitochondria um in a way uh, sort of run the show because they they are the ones which make the exclusion zone water for us they make their own infrared they make hormones and they make atp and without that connection from the sun to the mitochondria it, things are, are not going to function properly and it's all back to if you create create chaos in the mitochondria which is your battery or your engine you're just going to propagate uh, this idea of chaos um further okay and mitochondria want to go to bed as well. They have their own circadian rhythms that they don't, you know, they don't want to be thrash, you know, thrashing about producing things in the middle of the night. Uh, that's why they, you know, for some people who are who are new to hormones, it's not just the pineal gland that makes melatonin. The mitochondria make melatonin as well. So, you know, it's uh, you, you want order right inside your cells. So it's like the um, it propagates through not just order in me, but inside my cells as well and, and in my molecular machines, my mitochondria. Right. Which brings up a really good point. So natural um, light during the day outside, not through a window, an open window is fine, but not through glass, um, brings order to chaos, gives us electrons, helps us our bodies function properly, but by the same token, at night, once the sun has set, darkness plays a pivotal role. So the lack of light is important. Yeah, definitely. Because, you know, the melatonin could be looked at as a hormone of light or a hormone of darkness, because if you don't get enough light in the morning to make it, you're not going to have um, enough of a supply of serotonin. So, yes, the dark is hugely important because that's when, you know, we we go to sleep and this is when all of our healing processes can happen. So, and again, healing would be, we could class healing as creating order as well, because something's all say broken and we put it back together again and it's now ordered again. And then also what we, we touched on, you mentioned lime and toxins and heavy metals. If, if all of this is working and there's less chaos in the body and the mitochondria, they're, they're very capable of kicking out the heavy metals and things themselves if you make order um like you know when your house is messy it's just really difficult to do things whereas when it's all nice and tidy you can get stuff done and that's the same for the for the mitochondria if everything's ordered uh, and they're not there's not a level of inflammation for whatever reason so we're just talking about a bad circadian rhythm or bad geolocation or uh, a mixed up light and dark cycle which would create chaos if we remove that, the mitochondria are perfectly capable of getting rid of things because they can. the person's got enough energy to heal now, not just survive. So that's, I think, a fundamental problem that people have is they've got enough energy to survive, but they can't thrive. And that's where I think quantum biology provides this enormous uh, other lens to allow people to tap into energy, basically, because uh, very simplistically a structured water can act as a as a battery in the body and then um the more electrons we've got you know we, we've got a, a better sort of um 
redox potential in the body as well. Our charge is, is favorable for health. Like the more negatively charged we are, the, the, the better, not more negative. So yes, that, that would be how I would try and say it in a sort of um, concise way. And yes, and so that would be another piece of in terms of how we're looking at all of the benefits of of outdoor light and sunshine mm-hmm. is it's charging our batteries, which yeah. comes back a little bit to the structured water. Do you want to say a little bit more about the about the water and how that relates to um our negative charge? Oh yeah, I can do, yes. But also just to say, um, Dr. Pollock is, um, is going to come on my YouTube channel because I told him I did protein folding, like in a in cells and, and in war in 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 uh, not in a cell, and how the water is part of the protein folding effect. So you know, he was really excited. So he said he'd come and do an interview. But that but that's the thing. He's, oh, I look forward to that. His, his level of knowledge of of structured water is um extreme is vast, but then in terms of what you mentioned about, um, I mentioned EMFs as well, and you mentioned Lyme and toxins. The the larger the um, exclusion zone, it also sort of it can act like a buffer to, to, to get things out. And then, of course, exclusion zone water, in terms of its consistency, is slippery. So that would be really important when it comes to blood flow. And that's another big topic that people get quite upset about would be heart disease obviously having worked in it when people are barking at the wrong tree and not looking into how how, you know is is it a structured water problem uh that that we've got not a cholesterol or whatever issue right yeah i mean it has implications across so many um different fields the yeah the vascular system being hugely important especially now uh, in the post-COVID world, it's really important to understand all of this stuff. But also, I think um, having done medical ketogenic diets, mm-hmm. I think the ketones get too much of the praise. Whereas mm-hmm. if you think about it, the fat's going to provide more electrons than the glucose. So you're going to get more of the goodies at the end and more structured water and more um, infrared. So I think in part, the um, fat as a fuel um, concept does increase people's um, exclusion zone water from a, from a diet point of view, um, but obviously there are other ways to increase it and and make sure you don't decrease it as well. So as I mentioned, there was the red light which increases the exclusion zone, and then EMFs, which studies are suggesting that they sh- make the exclusion zone smaller. Uh, so yes, and and then back to the whole chaos idea that the structured water is structured. So the more of it you have, the less chaotic um, the signaling in the body. And then right back to what we were talking about at the beginning about the the rapid signaling through the body. That again, if you've got um, charged particles uh, in a, in a structured way in structured water, that could explain the extremely fast communication in the body that you cannot explain neurologically. Right. Yeah, biochemistry cannot explain how quickly the signals travel through our body, but quantum- yes, uh, yeah, and also bringing it back to sort of the real world and people that fibromyalgia is clearly a, a, um, a situation of lack of energy somewhere, and again, it's often a, a lack of exclusion zone water when you break down somebody's life and see what they're eating, what they're doing, what their circadian rhythm is like, what their blue light and technology exposures like. And then chronic pain is another massive problem. And uh, structured water, just to bring it back to the to collagen and um, fascia, that structured water is, is vital for fascia being able to move smoothly and just moving about like this creates sort of piezoelectrics and um, structured water. So again, we all, well, I know when people that do yoga and Pilates and, and Tai Chi and any kind of movement that there's, you know, you can get better from stuff by taking up movement. So maybe it wasn't the movement and maybe it was the structured water all along. So, so in some ways you can pick anything from quantum biology, like structured water, look at all the disciplines that I've talked about from biochemistry to movement, to hypnosis and neurology and then keto diets and say, well, it's all the, just the structured water. And, and the, the more that I think about it like that, the more that I think maybe it just is the water. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, Carrie Bennett talks a lot about that too. I think she's reaching similar conclusions. And just a point of clarification um, for the audience or anyone who's 
newer to this topic. When you say structured water and easy water, you are you using those terms interchangeably? Yeah. Could you just no. quickly say how structured easy water is different from what we traditionally think of as water? Oh, right. Yes, I'll just say that the easy or exclusion zone water is the structured water that gets produced internally by the mitochondria and structured water that people make by putting water out in the sun and drinking it. That's structured water, whereas exclusion zone water, I I, act, I used it interchangeably, whereas I, I'm 100 percent into making unusual drinking waters. But I, for the sake of simplicity, um, have been referring to easy exclusion zone water produced inside the body, the one that coats all of our internal biological membranes that got made inside the mitochondria um, by us, not not that we took in. And um, yes, I I do think that the structured water um, is really interesting as well, because this comes back to hypnosis now. And why why on earth did I say, am I hypnotizing someone's structured water? Because in pretty much every discipline, whatever religion you want to look at, from Christianity to Buddhism or and even Hinduism, there are mantras that you say over liquid and then you give it to the person. And obviously the people know about making um, holy water, but there are more Christian ones. But then there are all sorts of different Buddhist and, and Hindu ones. And the Hindu ones are really funny because lots of them are to do with misbehaving husbands. But the, that's <laughs> obviously you can see that a woman's circle has um, uh, made these o- over the generations. So that's where you would talk to the water, you say a special mantra, and then you give it to the husband or person to drink and yes of course I've tried this in hypnosis and maybe I was imagining it but it did did work better and back then I didn't know anything about structured water I had a friend who told me if you shout at water you know um it makes it different and I just thought he was being silly and then I I'd I'd already experimented with the mantras and realized oh maybe I'm doing a spell on it I don't know and now I'm beginning to think actually maybe there's a lot even more to water that than I thought and I had had poo-pooed it in the past because I'm I was a biochemist in the same way that I poo-pooed um homeopathy which is something we're now going to probably talk about later when we talk about um sort of addictions but yeah I think I'm sort of like the the more I think about the water the more I think maybe we are just a water being not I mean some people will say we're an electric being some people say we're a vibrational being but, but maybe we can be all of these things but we're just not a lump of flesh that's all (laughs) <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah. So fascinating about the water. Yeah. And this idea that the water can hold memory, um, the water can hold trauma, which means, you know, there's there's an argument to be made, I think, for living a circadian aligned lifestyle, making it easier to overcome past trauma. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, and the thing is, I think, um, you know, when you use DM- DMSO, um, that can... Uh, affect the structured water um, but it can also affect the trauma as well because you can that's the benefit and uh, that's actually one of the negatives of the structured water it's all very clever and it can help us and as I've described but it can also misbehave because it might remember something we don't want it to remember so this is where the DMSO comes in which is dimethyl sulfoxide so this can um, you can massage it in and, and it's been around for ages and then you technically could maybe just tell the person oh i'm just trying to get rid of your trauma um if they believe in structured water or you could just say oh this is hypno massage and see if it goes away and, and there are for certain um people who've already played with this idea of using biochemistry to try and disrupt this structured water with a an emotional trauma in it so again i'm open to anything and i know people have done that and it worked and and it's been around for a long time as well and it's very cheap and i'm beginning to wonder now uh, you know is it a big trick that all the free stuff is actually what works the free and cheap simple things and all this expensive stuff is sort of just some kind of um matrix that we're living in anyway i know it it, it, what's so interesting about that point is that I hear because, you know, we have a community for practitioners and I hear from so many people that one of the stumbling blocks 
that they have with their clients to implementing strategies like going outside when you first wake up in the morning and taking sun breaks during the day is that the feedback is like, this is so simple. Like it can't really be doing anything. We've been so conditioned to think we need some kind of pill or device um, in order to get a big result. Oh, definitely. And and this comes into what could be off-putting for people. They think they need to buy sperity lamps and half-body red light panels um, in order for it to, to work. Um, and, uh, you know, yes, maybe for some people, but it, I think it's back to you don't need all of these gadgets. Yes, you can always experiment with them. Um, and you are right that people think they need a machine or, or a pill or or whatever. So that's another um, sort of rabbit hole that could we could go down on. Because I, I once um, asked somebody who's quite senior in the community, I've got a severity lamp, but it kicks out a huge amount of EMF. So I asked him, what should I do? And he said, well, if you live in the UK, you should buy another severity lamp. Um, the, the light is more important than the EMFs. So, so it does come down to sometimes... It, uh, yeah. People think they've got to do everything perfectly and it's impossible. So you've got to have the trade off. So what's worse, the EMFs or me not having any vitamin D from uh, an artificial lamp in a in a northern latitude. Uh, so that's the other thing. I think that, um, again, people think it's too simple, but also they can also get overwhelmed because it's too many new things to do all at once. So it goes both ways. and It just depends on the client. Um, and obviously I get clients that want to just do everything and take a big overhaul and that doesn't work sometimes. And then I get some people, it takes them like a month to buy blue blockers. So, you know, you just have to, and I used to get really angry about this. I didn't ever show it to them. And then I just thought, oh, for goodness sake, you know, just leave them alone. They all work at different paces. They've got different clocks in their heads. Like from teaching Pilates for, for ages, I can just tell there are slow people and fast people and people that take three years to learn an exercise and somebody might get the idea in in one and they're all the same age and it's just leave them alone to go on their journey themselves and I've just thought well you know that's fine if, if that works for you let's just do it that way but then you know sometimes you do get a client where they do have to have the the red light panels they've got they mustn't miss a sunset they have to do a cyclical ketogenic diet they need you know to change all their light bulbs and have emf blocking clothing uh, and that's the only thing that wake you know works and then and i've had other people where just the sunrise and sunset has has been a massive game changer so i think it's um it, the good thing about quantum biology is it's very easy for people to test it out themselves at home you don't need a teacher to help you really like with um, Pilates, you need someone to stand there. So it's very easy for people who want to be a practitioner or whatever to play around with things at home. And it's also for patients, it's something you don't need to keep checking, like say with a psychiatrist, if someone wants to reduce their meds, they've got to wait for somebody to give them permission to. Whereas with quantum biology, you can fiddle about with, you know, light and hot and cold and household objects and, and structured water. And, and, and it gives people back a bit of independence, if that makes sense, because it's all a lot of it sort of homemade. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. And I think it's a really good point to bring up because another way that we've been conditioned, I think, is to outsource our health, right? Like, you know, we spend, we go to the doctor and get our labs checked. And then if the doctor says we're fine, then we're fine. And I think this sort of chronic illness epidemic that's crept up on us has really changed that because we have doctors saying to patients, well, you're, you're fine, but they're like, I don't feel fine, but they haven't reached a crisis point where mainstream medicine can really help them, they're in this gray area. And so more and more people are realizing we have to be in charge of our own health and we have to be our own health advocates. And what easier way to do that than just sort of control our light environment, think about the timing of when we eat, um, think about our exposure to artificial light. Um, you know, these are very simple things that can have profound effect. And that's a great point, Sarah, like you don't need, you know, I, I think it's really important to work with a practitioner if you're working through something, um, mm. a chronic illness, but just once you've done that and learned from that person, you really can be in charge of your own health. 
Yeah, and also I think as a practitioner, it gives me, I'm I'm not worried about somebody hurting themselves looking mm -hmm. at sunrises and sunsets, whereas I am sometimes worried about people and supplements. And um, even though with the keto diets, people have triggered the hypermania and all sorts in themselves. And uh, I had a, a friend of mine's a psychiatrist who does um, keto diets and somebody took themselves to accident and emergency because of a keto diet. And it's like, it's not that anything bad happened. It's just the client got terrified or the patient. And it's like, it's just some food. Whereas you can't, you know, it, you can't hurt yourself with quinton minerals and um, some red light panels and a bath with ice in it. And, and, and it gives me a great sense of relief um to think well you know they're just going to have to do it themselves and also i think there's a lot to say with people being able to say okay it was a joint effort so I, I have friends who um he's like he's a really close friend of mine but he, he does say well i healed this person i mended them and i think no you facilitated the healing and it takes a and, the, and, the, and he's a great big like he's a massive bodybuilder man i love him to bits and all these people are worship 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 and it's like no people you know you, you also can do it all by yourself so you don't need him and i do love him and he's really knowledgeable but I have noticed this dependency on him. So obviously he is extremely busy all the time. But the problem is the clients then think, oh, I can't do it. It's back to what we were saying. They uh, have become dependent on, on, on somebody else for their health care. So it's just back to what you were saying. And, and I do actually think 100 percent people need to work with a practitioner uh, in the beginning because, my my big friend, he he's got into quantum biology because I'm into it. And he's been going, ho, 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 I've been seeing the sunrise and going out with my dogs. And I said, well, what blue blockers have you got? Oh, what are blue blockers? And he's been getting up at six o'clock in the morning, turning the lights on in the house, messing up his circadian rhythm, <laughs> then going out and seeing the sunrise. And he's he's really intelligent. He's a biochemist. And it's one of these things that you know, that's where you would need a practitioner because he just thought he was doing it right. And this has gone on for three months and this only kept transpired last week because we had a big argument about Andrew Huberman uh, and uh, <laughs> and about how you can go on, on, on the internet and get watch lots of podcasts and videos, but you get you get pieces of information and it's not complete. And that he's a classic example of like he does, he's, he's learned from me just by listening the rest of the quantum biology thing. But he's messed it up every single morning because he didn't know, you know, it's, you don't just see the sunlight. You've got to not turn the lights on first. Yes. No, it's true. And that is it's it is. I think it's two sides of the same coin. I think, yeah, if you're in a bad if you have a chronic illness or even just want to get better, I really think it's important to work with a practitioner. Mm -hmm. And then the flip side of that af is after working with a practitioner who has a quantum biologic approach, uh, you, you will be in a place where you understand and trust your own intuition, your own body, and know what it's supposed to be doing so that mm -hmm. your life is completely changed going forward. You're not dependent on a specific supplement or a specific thing if it's an, an education almost that happens that you, you're right you cannot get on the internet um and for practitioners yeah that's why you know that's why um we created the curriculum that we have because practitioners were having the same issue so it's like put thing put everything you need to know in one place i think it's back to what we were talking yeah. about before about um with just because we might talk about addiction later, the 12 steps that if you leave one step out, it doesn't work. And that was my friend and the doing everything right, except turning the lights on in the morning is a prime example of exactly that. And I think as we, as I think Carrie will probably agree that if you can't do anything at all, then if you see the sunrise or, or the morning UV, you know, for, you know, first without seeing a phone or, or a lamp at least at least you started the day right and and I'm not sure I mean different people have different views about what's what you what if you can't do any of it would be the most important thing to start with but you know that's like for another day uh, yeah. but also I think I I might have projected my own um personality on the therapist and um sort of client relationship because I'm very independent and and have never I, I very occasionally sought out a practitioner and I've always been a little bit disappointed except the only person I regularly I'm in, in Carrie's group and that's somebody if I was to buy a consultation I would 
but then because I've been in a group, we sort of, I've been mentored, if that makes sense. And then obviously part of the course here, you know, that coming in and doing the Q&As, because it's not just my questions, I get everybody else's collective questions and, and they're all based around a real human and um, about clients. And this is what makes me quite cross about the internet. And this is what the argument about Andrew Huberman was about. It's like, I don't care if my friend adores him, he's never seen any clients. I'm not dissing his knowledge or anything in any way at all, in any shape or form. He knows way more than me. He's just never seen a client. And when you work with humans, they don't do what the text, what, what you want. Yeah. The study might say this is what yes, happens, but that's exactly. not necessarily what happens with any given individual. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why in our, you know, on our faculty, um, which hope that she will be joining soon, we have people who do both because I don't think you can teach people, you can teach clinicians if you're not also working with people because yeah, people are filled with surprises. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, research may say one thing, but you never know what's going to happen in practice. Oh, oh exactly. And, and, and it's like they also can be massively helpful as well, because I've got some super nerds as clients and they go and find devices and objects and things that I've never even thought of doing. And even one of them, and this is like a really naughty thing, he said, um, oh, I've started um uh, because what we were talking about with uh, homeopathy in a small dose, I've started microdosing um, venlafaxine and it's really working, except my doctor really told me off. And then I've never even thought about the concept of taking a, a psychiatric medication in a tiny dose. And, and it, that's what and, and like he's a massive nerd and he's got like all the, he, he is a um, I've got all the gear and no idea. And I love him. And he's the kind of person that has to have a practitioner. Otherwise, he'll just end up with a house full of goodness knows what. So, um, yeah, it, it is it is important to work with people because they the clients bring you stuff as well. And they tell me things I've never heard of or they have conditions I've never seen before or DNA results and weird labs. And, that, and then we can sort of collectively, you know, put, put, put it together. So it's, it is really important to, you know, see clients. Yeah, I think so too. And I, and this is sort of bringing us around to think of be our final area to, to dive into, which is quantum entanglement. Oh, so yes. We talked about the physical benefits of, um, you know, a circadian optimized lifestyle and even the psychological benefits. Uh, we've, you've mentioned addiction a few times and we were chatting about that before and, um, you know, the possible applications of quantum biology to addiction. So let's start with how you would explain quantum entanglement, because quantum biology, I feel like we have, the word quantum gets thrown around so much and means, can mean so many different things from the woo-woo to a very, very hard science. Okay. So, so in it, biology, it, we're talking about a very specific thing in terms of. Okay. So uh, people, it's all about, first of all, it would say if I try to explain it to my mum and dad, because that's always how okay. I start. Okay. So it would be <laughs> and everything, we're all connected because when we say with the Big Bang, if there was like um, we were all squashed together and then we exploded apart at some point, we were all touching. And then in terms of particles, you know, it, it's to do with um, if you um, shout at, uh, say, a particle um, in the UK, one its partner or it's one that it was entangled with will burst into tears in New Zealand, uh, and that's the uh, how I would explain very simply quant quantum entanglement. Because if you start to talk about spin pairing with electrons, people it glazes over their head. So, so what it's sort of I'm describing to people is that um, there can be uh, you can and if one thing can be you can do one thing over here and it affects something miles away. So again. Do it does does time and distance even matter or, or or exist? And then when it comes into addictions, it's all back to um this idea of being for somehow emotionally or quantum. I don't want to say emotion, but somehow our our particles seem to be uh, tied up or entangled to a particular compound. And whether it's our emotions or whether it's our uh, biology, but 
but uh, and I think in the context why I was talking about it with you as I was saying about with nicotine that how does my body remember um, the, the nicotine if I've not had any for 10 years and then as soon as I have some it's almost if I had some a straight away um, boof once again we're reunited and I must have it every day so that would be a sort of loose way of trying to because quantum entanglement can get very complicated, but it's fundamentally about um, th every, everything's connected or like a big tapestry, but we don't know how it's connected. And, you know, we have this um, sort of coexistence. So maybe on alcohol, which people sometimes have issues with because humans co-evolved with alcohol, uh, um, most likely, um, and it's been around a long time, we, we've got this entanglement with this particular molecule. So we have this sort of attachment, whether it's emotional. So this is where I've started to think about um, the quantum biology side of, um, okay, fair enough. Um, somehow there's an entanglement between my, by, my atoms and this particular substance, uh, but how do I untangle them? Right. And that's where it becomes interesting. We were talking about like a 12 step approach or a spiritual approach or where there isn't actually a physical um, substance that's relieving the addiction to a different physical substance. It's something that happens on a deeper level that kind of lifts the, that um, compulsive desire to have more and more of whatever it is that we're addicted to. Mm -hmm. So. But then it's also it doesn't it extends outwards. Uh, I mean, it's like um, I, we were talking about taking in a substance and then you, know, you can't blame dopamine for everything. But that's the thing that we're getting the kick off. So um, there's some pathway because obviously I work with men a lot and the porn addiction comes up and you can't eat that. Yet that people do get really into it. But then fundamental sex is like a hugely primal sort of human behavior again. So all of these things that. Um, you know, we get we get addicted to there. That there's like a very deep rooted emotional connection to them uh, as well, and obviously technology, which makes me really cross, and I do it as well, and my niece and nephew do. But that's not necessarily technology. It's it's being it's other humans on technology that we're addicted to. It's kind of interaction. Um, so yes, I think it's one of these things. It's like the water that I know there's a quantum link, and then I mean, lots of people who are work with addictions who are coming into the quantum it's what they'll be thinking oh yeah well I know I could look at it that way and I can see how that that would work based on my practice and and obviously the 12 steps um there's the great big sort of consciousness um and spiritual element to it so uh, again I think with the 12 steps you know that's not the whole thing like you know if you try to do the 12 steps with just the consciousness bit it probably wouldn't work because it would just be a one step but then then it comes back to you know um maybe i'm not maybe i should be using movement and dmso and massage more to get an addiction out that traditionally people think oh I, I, i've got i've got i'm addicted to cigarettes or alcohol i'll go and see sarah for hypnosis whereas really we should be doing something involving trying to massage it out move it out with some dmso but i've never tried that before because it's all back to where does the addiction live is it living in the um structured water or is it back to this thing i was saying where with the consciousness that there's no definitive proof that it lives inside our, our brains it, it's sort of it could be outside so where where does the addiction where does it live and uh that's that and what is it you know on a quantum level that that's what i mean it's like i'm trying to make it into some kind of particle when maybe it's you know and then this ties back into emotions and thoughts all have being able to have substance as well like egregores and the ether again so i'm now this is getting sort of more i wonder where this will go as i evolve and develop as a practitioner now i can look at addictions through a quantum lens and i'm sure there are people who have already been doing what I've just described um, for ages and are laughing um, or people who, who, who will never meet that know who are doing quantum addiction healing. Yeah. Um, probably. And I, I think what, what I love about quantum biology is that um, we have got some evidence that 
these quantum processes happen inside of our bodies. And then we take it out to the level of consciousness and it gets a little more woo. But if it's true in our bodies, why wouldn't, you know, why couldn't it expand? And so if we're then talking about quantum entanglement, it matters who we're around, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we've created a quantum biology community because we find that the knowledge and the wisdom grows when we spend time around each other. And in the same way, like you were mentioning about a 12 step recovery process, if you're in a group of people who all have their consciousness focused on a spiritual principle at the same time, yeah. there could be some kind of entanglement happening there. That's healing at a level at what level? I don't know. <laughs> oh, oh, that's back to Ruben Question. Sheldrake and the um, the morphic fields. You know, about mm -hmm. if one person yeah. in the group learns something, the rest of the group is more likely to learn it quicker. And whether it's blue tips being able to steal the milk out of the by pecking the hole in the top of the milk bottle, and it then it propagates it through all of the blue tips throughout Europe, or whether it's humans learning, you know, how to overcome an addiction. Yeah, definitely, there's some kind of you know morphic field and collective unconscious, but that works the other way that if you remove somebody um like say one of my clients who um like this i don't know why this is really interesting lots of electricians seem to have cocaine issues in the uk and we do think it's something to do with the emfs and the um and the blue light and the dopamine but if, mm -hmm. if you remove them from you know their friends who do it a lot of the problem goes away um but then there's always the solitary users. So, so that's the other the other issue that sometimes if you remove somebody from their dealers and their other friends and it becomes socially not acceptable anymore to do that particular substance, people stop. And this is also ties in with food, because I think that's the worst addiction because you can't get away from it, whereas you can remove people from pubs or um, take them away from the trigger of of the addiction. Um, not that, that there's always a physical trigger. It can be completely and utterly all sorts of things can do it. But like you said, it's there's something to be said about a group of minds doing something together whether it's productive or destructive because yeah. with all of these morphic fields and quantum effects they can be really destructive as well and this is yeah. back to what i was saying about yeah. why i really like the quantum biology community because it's non-threatening and you know it's for me a, a safe place and um, I think there's so much um, sort of nowadays, we're so threatened from all different angles that to find a community and, and a place where, you know, you can be weird if you want to, because, you know, no matter what, there's always going to be somebody who um, is more weird, not because you mentioned woo woo and stuff like that. So, you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't matter. We, we don't mind because, you know, it, people are totally open, whereas some communities um uh, and uh, quite a very a sort of one sort. Like I think I was saying to you, if somebody wants to be a Pilates teacher or a personal trainer, that excludes a huge amount of body type. So lots of people wouldn't be welcome in that community. And then the food and keto and carnivore or vegan, whatever community can get a bit militant. And then you can become obsessed with food and, you know, that can be unhealthy as well. And whereas in the quantum biology um world yes of course we've got different views about what's more important water or light or vibration or sound but fundamentally we have a, a, an open mindset if that makes sense so i just feel it's a, a a safe a safe place to be in and that is massively important for learning because if you look into steve kotler's work about the flow states if somebody's stressed the creativity and the flow state and the learning isn't going to happen so there's there's like a lot of value in in having a safe group and, and and community, and that would be another reason for people who are wanting to sort of who are considering joining this. That's a, a huge thing for me as well. The other people, right? Well, I'm so glad you feel that way because, and that is just really naturally evolved. We don't even have like community guidelines or anything. People just leave all their baggage at the door and come to learn and share. Um, and it's, yeah, it's quite inspiring. And the, the wisdom that comes out of people as they learn, um, these concepts, right? Like it, you just sort of watch the watch lights come on and people will just start sharing. Oh, well, is that why this and this and this, and it's just like the most extraordinary wisdom just seems to, to get switched on and flow out. 
from people, even if they just are hearing about things for the very first time. But, but then, but they're not really like with me. We we've been exposed it to it so many times, and we've never tweaked. And I think because um, I know a bit of your background, you were saying that you'd been exposed to quantum biology, and because you weren't desperate you, or, or weren't ready, you just ignored it. Mm-hmm. And I think it's all like I've had twenty years of it, and I should have known. I should have discovered this ten years ago. But I think I had all. I didn't really like you said. I think it's you, you've basically created a place where we can all all come and and sort of. Um, work out how our therapies and and treatments work from a quantum level, and um, that's that that's kind of a a, a different approach uh, because we all have we all have the wisdom. It's just sometimes you need the lens to realize if that makes sense. And people, yes. like I was saying, lots of this is not you know, people have known about all of these things for ages and there'll be pe- people or yogis laughing at us going, for goodness sake, you idiots, we knew all about the sun salutation. Why is it in the, the you know, we've got a whole sort of yoga sequence to salute the sun and we clap when it comes up. Y- you know, we knew all along. So, you know, there are, we do know really about all of this. And I think it's easy to just to get, lo- to lose touch with with, with, with what's important. Yes. No, it's, it's true. There is a, I mean, this is ancient wisdom. It's just being sort of recalibrated according to our modern scientific process, which is wonderful because it's bringing it, it's bringing it back to people who, who think that way, which is most of us. Um, and yeah, so if everyone who is a practitioner and you find a little, you're a little bit interested in this, please do come uh, join our community. Um, the links in the show notes, all are welcome. We do live events every um, few times a month and we have lots of videos in our library. And then Sarah, if, if someone wants to work with you or learn from you, uh, where should they go or what have you got on offer these days? I know uh, you're, you're study so much. It's always changing. Yeah. Well, I think it's all um, like you hear there's, I've got a lot of stuff. And I think what I was saying to Meredith is it's and other people I'm sure have done this, it's very easy to try and jump onto the next new shiny object and get really stressed and overwhelmed. So um, in terms of uh, reaching out to me to just talk about things or work with me from quantum biology or anything I've talked about, I'm much more quantum focused now, but I do do obviously know all about the other side. It would be um, busy superhuman. That would be on Instagram or YouTube or TikTok, or my name is Sarah Pugh and you just type that in Sarah Pugh leads and you'll be able to find my website and me and you can just uh, fill in a form or just send me an email I, I'm pretty easy to find um on on online and I, I um my social media is all kind of open like you can send me di- direct messages on, on things and I will reply and then in terms of making a course I'm making a quantum biology 101 um course well I have actually made it it's just I'm it's I'm just re-recording it and it's just sort of to cover um what I think is the really helpful to get people started with quantum biology, but also with the science. Um, and I've got sort of diagrams and more about structured water because it's a very abstract thing. And some things you can talk about, but a lot of things you need a picture. And then um, it's going to be called uh, Quantum Hormone Healing 101. And it'll be coming out, um, well, it will, will be out uh, by the time this goes out. And it's a uh, a course that you would download, but you can always email me if you need any help with, with anything uh, to do with the course. And that will be around about $67. That's um, my offering. So there's like a little course or you can work with me directly if you want sort of um, to speak to a human, if that makes sense. All right. So, you, so you're available working one-on-one with people um, yeah. or they can get your latest wisdom in this in the oh yeah yeah I already started um taking quantum clients because again some of it I was doing quantum already I just didn't know how and then uh, as soon as I, literally from day one from your course because I don't I, I know Sarah Kleiner and, and Carrie before so I'd already got a lot and then I and then I then I found the whole course and that was 
are really helpful for me because it's like having everything in one place. And even though technically I knew a lot of it before, it's this thing about some people think, well, this is so simple. Why do I need to do a course? It's like, well, no matter what, there's always going to be things that you haven't got or really basic stuff. And it's really good to just go and do the course and have it all in one place. And then you've got all the community to bounce ideas around. So um yeah that that's that's another um important reason to join a community and, and not just like pick knowledge all over but yes i do see clients for, for for quantum and people can bring other sort of situations and even though i'm a medical ketogenic diet person i can accommodate any way of eating and if somebody categorically wants to be vegan uh, i'm more than happy to just do quantum things with them so i and, and if somebody wants to do a medical ketogenic diet i will so it's one of those things that the food wars are actually really irritating me now um but <laughs> yeah. i i will or i've got a quite a detailed form because i have learned that um listening to the client and reading about them and getting the big picture it gives me a really good chance to look for okay what what's missing out of their jigsaw and what, where do i fit in yeah Sounds like a, a fabulous approach. And if someone has the opportunity to work with you, I highly encourage them to go for it. And Sarah, if you're listening um, to this on a podcast and driving, Sarah is S-A-R-A-P-U-P-U-G-H. Um, and at Busy Superhuman, you can find her on all the places, uh, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Sarah, thank you so much. Um, I feel like we could probably have talked for another hour, but it, we should probably wrap it up. Um, and uh, yeah, let's do this again. Next time you um, read a paper that blows your mind, let me know. We'll do a podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, th I think it has to always be um, something that um, can be shared and applied. So there's all amazing papers that blow my mind. But I'm very much now, well, that was cool, but how do I do it? How do I apply it? Amazing. That is that is the spirit of this community for sure. What is the practical application in terms of making people's lives healthier and better? Beautiful. Okay. So next time you read a paper that blows your mind and gives you an idea <laughs> for practical application, we will do another talk. Thank yeah. you so much, Sarah. It was a pleasure. Thank you. This has been the Quantum Biology Collective Podcast. To find a practitioner who practices from this point of view, visit our directory at quantumbiologycollective.org. If you are a practitioner, definitely take a look at the Applied Quantum Biology Certification, a six-week study of the science of the new human health paradigm and its practical application with your patients and clients. We also love to feature graduates of the program on this very podcast. Until next time, the QBC.